Okay, so uh, we're going to look at our next section um, in complex algebra, um, and uh, we're going to use uh, polar, you know, the polar version of numbers or the polar representation of numbers to help us solve uh, algebra problems um, or to look at things in the complex plane. Okay, and uh, you know before we take a look at um, you know this this Demong's theorem uh, in our notes, uh, one thing I want to maybe look at or think about um, is okay, like a problem you maybe saw in Ha two last year, like i plus one to the fifth power. Right, so we're not really like I mean like there's one way to solve this. Like I mean there's many ways to solve this, and one of them could be oh I could like take i plus you know i plus one times i plus one times itself five times, um, but that'd be very um, tedious. Um, I could also remember um, my binomial <laughs> expansion, where you start with one, 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 two, one, one, three, three, one, one, four, six, four, one. So zero, one, two, three, fourth, one more power, one, five, ten, ten, five, one. And think about it from that perspective as we expand out that binomial. Um, both are, you know, obviously ways to solve this. But let's take a look at maybe representing this number uh, as a polar, you know, right, as a polar, um, uh, I guess, look at it through uh, its polar representation. And so um, i plus 1, if we ignore that fifth power for a second, i plus 1 um, is... Uh, going over, well, and I remember we always see it like a plus bi form. So we're going over one in the real and one in the i. One in the real and one in the i. So we're right here. That point right there, it like has a distance that's root two away and has an angle of 45 degrees. So I could think about that. That's root two cis uh, 45 degrees. That's the representation of i plus one. So what if I take that number to the fifth power? And if I think back to yesterday's lesson, um, when I'm multiplying, I'm, I just have to multiply the, the uh, magnitude. And when I'm uh, multiplying, I can simply add the, uh, you know, the argument. So to the fifth power means it's a rep you know, repeated multiplication five times. And so that's really what um, DeMolve's theorem says. And so kind of going back to this guy up here. So if you have repeated multiplication, which is really just powers, right? So rather than um, thinking about that in its A plus BI form, if you think about it in the polar form, then the powers, you just multiply however many of those um, uh, magnitudes that you have, and then you add up the arguments if you think about that, you add up um, n of them, it's the same thing as n times that value. So um, what ends up happening is we could say this is equal to, I change my thickness here, there it is. This is equal to the square root of 2 to the fifth power, cis, and then it'd be 45 times 5. So uh, then I can simplify this. So root 2 to the fifth power, that's um, I think about that, that's 2 to the half power to the fifth is one way to think about that. Sis, uh, 45 times 5 is 225. And if you think about like 2 to the, like, you know, 2 to the half, that's 2 to the 5 halves, or root 2 to the fifth power, that means like, so root 2, root 2, root 2, root 2, so much easier to do this in person. Uh, like, so every, every 2 pair off, so that's a 2, 4, and there's 1 left over. So so 4 root 2, cis, 225. Now, remember, uh, 225, so that's uh, in quadrant number 3. And so if that has a hypotenuse of 4 root 2, it must have went over 4 and down 4. Over 4, down 4. Oops, there it is. So if I rewrite it into its a plus bi form, it's negative 4 minus 4i. Four and um, again, if, if it gives it to us in a plus bi form, it's probably beneficial to give that back in a plus bi form, especially if it's such a nice angle like that. Okay. Now, um, the other thing we can think, or another way we could do this is solve algebra problems. So it says find all cube roots of negative 8. Well, you know, just by inspection, I know one of them is negative 2. 
um, right? So the cube root of negative eight, you could say, well, one of them is negative two. There's actually two more. Uh, one of the fundamental theorems of algebra says that um, the number of roots should match the degree of your equation. And so if I try to think about, okay, so come up with an equation like, oh, some number cubed is equal to that negative eight. That's when I would introduce the cube root and I would get, you know, negative two. Um, but then you could think about that from a factoring point of view. If I would have moved the eight over, set it equal to zero, um, I could have factored out that negative two or know that like x plus two would be a factor and then it would be same uh, opposite always positive um so plus four so like i would have this factored um double check that's x cubed minus 2x squared plus 2x squared um, plus 4x minus 4x perfect okay so i do it i would know that there's two more solutions here and heaven forbid we use the quadratic formula, we could complete the square and get two imaginary values. So we get a total of three solutions. But here's another way to solve this problem. And this is actually really, really cool, I think. So um, if we if we think about, um, oops, tried to lasso that and that didn't work. If we think about writing this in terms of its polar representation. So in other words, like x cubed, so solve the equation, oops, Solve the equation, uh, x cubed is equal to negative 8. But represent negative 8 as a complex number. And you might not think it's a complex number, but it is. There's just no imaginary parts, but it sits over here. Um, it goes negative, right? Like think about negative 8. That's negative 8 plus 0i. So I go over 8, but then I don't go in the, anywhere in the imaginary direction. Well, that's a radius of 8. Um, with a degree of 180 degrees. So I can think of this as x cubed is equal to 8 cis 180 degrees. Again, focusing on the angle, the angle is 180 degrees, and I'm 8 units away. And notice that 8 became positive since, since the 180 degrees already gives us that negative connotation. So now, how do I solve for x? Well, I'm going to do like the one-third power to both sides. And just like DeMauve's theorem says, when I do the one-third power, like if I think about that, I just have to do the one-third power to the radius, and I just multiply the angle by one-third. So if I do the one-third power of 8, oops, my bad. So that means x is equal to 8 to the one-third power, cis, 180 degrees times one third. And eight to the one third, that's the cube root. So x is equal to two cis 60 degrees. So um, now I'm anticipating uh, three solutions. And here's the piece that I really like that um, if I think about those particular three solutions, um, those, those, like, those, those three solutions are actually equally divided uh, in this complex plane. They're symmetric. And so here's where we're going to bring a little bit of that polar knowledge here. So, so in, in, in particular, uh, so 2 cis 60 degrees. So if I went to a 60 degree angle, went out 2, there's one of the solutions, but I know I'm anticipating three. And if I think about, um, like the unit circle has, you know, 360 degrees, if they have to be equally distributed, um, so I know that they're going to each be 120 degrees apart. So if I go 120 degrees more, remember we said this was 60, because that's what that said. If I go 120 degrees more, and I go out two in this direction, right? Think about what that point is right there. That point is uh, negative two. And we already knew that one of the solutions was negative two. So that just sort of confirms um, that, you know, that, that if I go 120 degrees more, that's two cis 180 degrees, because I went 120 degrees more and where did I get that 120? Well, the full circle is 360 and I know there's three solutions. So they meet each must have uh, the each have to be equally spaced 120 degrees apart. Now, um, let's get that third one. 
So then if I think about going 120 degrees more, that's going to put me at 300. So 2 cis 300 degrees. So if I go uh, 120 degrees more, here's the third and final solution. So that would um, that would be my uh, uh, 2 cis 300. This one over here we said was 2 cis 60, and then this this one right here is 2 cis 180. So I have three solutions that are equally distributed. And I want to go ahead and actually, you know, since 60 degrees and 180 and 300 are such nice values, let's go ahead and find those. So, um, you know, uh, 2 cis 60. So, you know, the hypotenuse is 2. Um, so 2 cis 60. So that, let's go back to red. So that one could be, um, uh, uh, the, what did that be? Uh, two, so it'd be one plus root three I, because like if I go over one, up root three, uh, this one we already knew was negative two. And then this one, if I go over, uh, if I go over one and down root three, so negative one plus, oh, sorry, positive one. Let's try that again. 1 minus root 3i. So there's my three solutions, um, right? 1 plus 3i. Oops. thought I highlighted that. 1 plus 3i, negative 2, and 1 minus 3i. Now, um, thinking about, like, you know, these complex conjugates that should, uh, in, in, in hindsight, make sense. Like I, I have a positive root 3i and a negative root 3i. And remember, that will always happen. They always come in conjugate pairs as long as your original equation has uh, real coefficients, which ours did. Um, now, the part that I really wish I could be here to see the look on your faces, because this is this is why we graph polar coordinates, because look at what's happening. If I start here... I can actually get to all the solutions as a polar uh, rows of petals length three. So, so, so that to me is so cool. Um, like I have a polar rose with three petals, and those three petals represent the three solutions to this particular um, equation. So, super cool. I uh, hope I can chance we can look at that, you know, in class and, and kind of just review that because that was so cool. Okay, let's do one more example before um, I'm probably, well, maybe, well, we'll see. Um, I might want to break the video here, just kind of break things up. So um, I want to solve x squared equals negative i. And I'm also wanting to compare this to the square root of negative i. And if you saw the, the last video um, from yesterday's notes, you'll remember that I said, well, this is more than just the square root of the square root of negative 1. Okay, we want to do more than that. So let's first, um, let's, you know, let's, let's first go ahead and um, just think about this in its polar form. x squared equals negative i. So negative i is straight down here, one unit in just the imaginary direction. So there are zero real components. There's negative one in the i direction. So right away, I could say x squared is equal to one cis. 270 degrees. And again, notice the one became positive because the two, the 270, um, the, you know, the, the, oops, there it is. The 270 uh, degrees has already given me that connotation that it's a negative value. Okay. So now we do the one half power to both sides. So X equals one to the one half, which is, you know, the square root of one. So still one cis, and I do half of 270 which is 135 degrees. So one of my solutions will be 135 degrees as an, as an angle going out one unit. Okay. So, um, but then I realized that there are two solutions. And again, thinking about 360 degrees, divide that by two, they're equally spaced. So I was looking for two solutions because it's X squared. That means they each have to be 180 degrees apart. So I'm going to add 180 degrees to this, add 180 degrees to get my second solution. And so my other solution is still going to be one cis, and then 180 degrees apart would be 315 degrees, which is down here. So this one is one cis 
315. This one up here we said was 1 cis 135. Both have nice arguments. So I'd want to go ahead and actually evaluate them. So 1 cis 135, 1 cis 135, that's over and up. So that's negative uh, root 2 over 2 plus root 2 over 2i. And then if I do the other one, uh, 1 cis 315, that's over root 2 over 2, down negative root 2 over 2. Over root 2 over 2, down root 2 over 2i. So there are my two solutions. Um, both of these numbers, if I square them, I'm going to get negative i. Um, and you could check your work. You don't have to do this for all the problems, but maybe for this first one. If you square negative root 2 over 2 plus root 2 over 2i. Let's say we do that first one. Negative root 2 over 2 plus the square root of 2 over 2i. Okay, so if I'm going to multiply that out, because I, like, I want to check my work, I want to actually square that. So negative root 2, and I got some rogue markings down here. Okay, so if I do negative root 2 over 2 times negative root 2 over 2, so that becomes positive 2 fourths. And then this times this would be negative two-fourths i, and then this value, um, this value times this value is a negative, another negative two-fourths i, and then root two over two i times root two over two i would be two-fourths i squared. Well, negative two-fourths and negative two-fourths becomes negative four-fourths, or negative i. Two-fourths is one-half, Two fourths uh, times negative, sorry, times i squared, which is negative one, is negative half. So yeah, in, in fact, we get negative i. We have just found what, what the square root of negative i is. Uh, one one of the answers is negative root two over two plus root two over two i. The other solution to this is root two over two minus root two over two i. Okay. Now, uh, now there, these are not complex conjugates of each other. Remember, complex conjugates uh, have the structure, if one is, one, one is a plus bi, the other one is a minus bi. And notice that like we have a negative and a positive, a positive and negative. So we don't have complex conjugates, but it doesn't really contradict what we already know because that only happens when you have real coefficients to start with. And we didn't. We had an imaginary coefficient. Okay. Now, the um, other thing that it says, there's so much in this example. It says, now just evaluate the square root of negative i. And notice the square root was already given. And if the square root's already given, it's referring to the principal root. Um, but the problem is, is that in, in, in the rectangular system, I should say, the principal root's always the positive one. But in, in the complex plane, how do you tell which one's positive? Because you have got an imaginary component as well. And so rather than saying it, the principal root is the positive root, we say the principal root has the smallest angle in standard form. So notice I got two solutions. I got the 135 and then I got 315. The principal root would be the one that comes first or the one that has the smallest positive uh, argument. So that 135. So if I just asked find the square root of negative i, I would set this up in a similar format, but then I would just choose the principal root, which is that first one. Okay, now um, the, all the other examples we'll work through, but I'm going to take a break on this video um, just because, I, you know, you've been sitting and watching and, um, you know, maybe take a break uh, and then come back and we'll work out the next couple of examples.